Mother in Backstroke. London in the year 1889. On August the 3rd, the weather was cold, the sky was black, and the smoke from domestic fires and rain fell. Rain and more rain. The late summer and autumn had the heaviest rain of the year. At 9 o'clock on that Thursday night, a great fire in London docks changed the color of the sky in the east end of London to a deep red. From the dirty streets, dark passages and slum houses of Whitechapel, hundreds of people went to watch the fire. Many of them were poor and homeless. They lived and slept in squalid lodging houses. The poorest lived in the streets and slept in doorways. As always, the pubs were uh, crowded and noisy, alcohol was cheap and it helped people to feel better. Many Marianne Nicosa was uh, in the frying pan pub on the corner of Brick Lane spending her last pennies on drink. She needed the money to pay for a bed in the White House, uh, her lodging house in Flower and Dan Street. But Marianne needed alcohol too, and she was drinking too much. Later that night, she tried to get a bed at Cooney's lodging house in Troll Street, but she had, no, she had to leave because she had no money. So she walked down on the wet cold streets, hoping to earn something. One of the poorest areas in London, White Chapel, did not have many street lamps. The streets were dark and dangerous. Mary Ann Nicholson was still walking the streets when her friend Ellen Oldham saw her at 2.13 a.m. on August. The one. By that time, Marianne, known as Polly, was very drunk. The woman talked for a few minutes. I asked Polly to come with her to the lodgings in Troll Street. But Polly went away along the White Chapel Road to try and get some money. After that, only one person saw her alive again, her two beds. Bex Row was a quiet, narrow road with a warehouse. These are on one side and some small cottages on the other. At the end of the cottages was the entrance to the house that stayed yard. And then the long wall of a school. The street had only one gas lamp. Then, and nearly 3.14 in the morning it was dark. At this hour Charles Cross Karma was walking to work. He became into Buck he came into Box Row from Brady Street. A few moments later he noticed something on the pavement in front of Brown's still yard and crossed the road. He saw that it was a woman. At that moment uh, he heard steps. It was another karma, Robert. Paul was on his way to work. Cross asked him to come and look. The man looked at the woman, but uh, in the darkness they did not know if uh, she was drunk or dead. They decided to continue on their way to work and tell the press policeman they met. They saw a policeman, Constable Jonas Mormison. Not far away, in Becker's Row, told him about the woman and then worked on to work. When Constable Moisen arrived at the gates of the stable yard, another police policeman, Constable John Nail, was already there. He had a lantern and he showed Constable Moisen a deep cut in the woman's neck. I passed this place at 3 um, 15 minutes, Constable and they said, but there was nothing here. The woman's legs are still warm, said Constable and Meisen. I think Mr. Cross interrupted her killer. Opposite the 
table yard stood uh, our house. The manager, Walter Parkis, and his wife were in their bedroom on the second floor. Mr. Parkis was awake most of the night, and Mr. Parkis slept badly and was awake between 1 and 2 o'clock. But they heard nothing. Heard nothing. Mr. Emma Green lived in the cottage next to the stable yard. She did not hear anything either. Polly Nichols killer walked quickly and silently and disappeared like a ghost. He probably ran into Whitechapel Road, out in a row, laying cold woods buildings. Polly Nichols died just a few days after her 43rd birthday. She was about 1, 15 eight tall and uh, had dark brown hair. She was wearing a blue dress, black woolen stockings, men's boots and a black straw bonnet. She had a comb, a white and chief and a broken piece of looking glass. These were all the possession she had. Polly was uh, an unfortunate, a polite Victorian word for a prostitute. She was probably an alcoholic. She lived in workhouses and when she had the money to pay in lagging houses. In December 1887, she was living in Trafalgar Square. Her friend Ellen said she was a clean, quiet person, and her father said, I don't think she had any enemies. She was too good for that. When Dr. Lane Wayne examined the body, he thought that the killer was right handed. The man probably strangled Polly first, but her put her on the ground and cut her throat. The police had no other clues to help them find the killer. There was also no obvious motive, such as robbery. This was a new and new type of murder which they could not understand.